Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. We're glad to have you with us and on live stream. You'll see a uh, sea of tie-dye here this morning, and there's a reason for it. You'll find out a little bit later in the service. Will you stand as we worship together this morning? Good morning and welcome to our July, last Sunday in July service. Amen. Now in that song there was um, uh, a shining bright light and uh, God's lighthouse for us. Uh, let's see, this past Friday evening I had an opportunity to sit outside for about an hour and, and to see the celestial bodies. And something that's pretty amazing, if you, when you get into the month of August, um, they have these things called meteor showers where you can sit in your chair at night and see what looks like someone could throw a sparkler through the night sky. And it's pretty amazing. It could be a short, it could be very, very long. I saw about six or seven this past Friday night. What else I saw was innumerable amount of stars and that light, that brilliant light that we have and different types of light, like dim light, super bright light, and all the lights in, in between. I heard someone say a few weeks ago that, um, boy, um, our light that we have, that light of Christ shines, the, d the darker it gets, our, our light is shining. It's pretty, pretty amazing in these, in these times that we're living. Now, something totally off topic, but I've got to ask a question, maybe it, from your experience. Are the fruit flies early this year? It seems like they're in full force early this year. Just a, a question I've got to ask. I don't know. Our house, we've got lots of fruit flies. Well, good morning and welcome. I'm going to invite you to open up your, your bulletin. You got one? I'm just going to go, go through some of these announcements. Um, so today, 
after church, we're going to have water and popsicles outside immediately after the service. And that's going to try and coax us out of the church building uh, sooner we can get, get outside into that, uh, that fresh air. So please remember to exit the uh, service uh, row by row uh, using the side door at the front and also at, at the back. Uh, watch your emails for the new kids church service. I think yesterday was uh, it came out. We tried to watch it yesterday. Uh, so if you want to check that out, please do so. <clears throat> Undercover pantry. Coolers are out between 8 a.m. and noon Monday through Thursday. Uh, and there are certainly needs. Uh, frozen prepackaged meats to feed a family for four. If you'd, please, if you'd like to um, help, please reach uh, Katie at the church office. Groups, we're still meeting during the week. Uh, Tuesday night is our Revelation Bible study uh, on Zoom. If you're not attending that yet, you'd like to, please reach out to Pastor Steve. 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday nights, they're meeting in person over at the old, uh, the old building, the Community Center. Uh, that's Common Threads Women Group. Uh, please reach out to Katie Shaw. Um, let's see, a couple reminders. Uh, face masks, if you're going to be singing, you want to be wearing those. Um, I talked about leaving the service uh, promptly after water and popsicles. Uh, we're going to be needing uh, volunteers. You know, we're going to be closing out the month of July this week, starting up August. When you get towards August, you've got to be thinking about school. And with school, uh, this church ministry is TLC on Fridays. That is starting back up um, real soon. So please see Pastor Steve or Lori if you're looking to volunteer or help out in any way capacity. Uh, with TLC. And again, I'll mention it one, one last time, is the undercover pantry is a need for frozen prepackaged meats to serve uh, a family of four in this community. And with that, uh, I'm going to uh, lead us into worship. Would you bow me, please? Heavenly Father, I do thank you for how you've revealed yourself to us um, these past days, this past week, where we can I see you, your creation uh, in the night sky of um, the celestial bodies, the stars, the planets, um, the vastness of, of your creation and, and then our lives, our individual lives and your plan. And, and that is your plan that we stop our lives, our busy lives to pause and we come before you this morning here, wherever we're at, but to come before you and worship you. So I thank you, Lord, that we can do that. We can do this as individuals and a, as a, a group unified in this church building here at Hope in Christ in Chichester, New Hampshire, but across this state and this nation and the world today, Lord, we're able to worship you and give you glory that you are due. So, Lord, I know I need your help doing that. I invite you in my heart to help me do this this morning, to, to lift you up in praise that what comes out of my mouth would be glorifying to you and that would become more true in my life this week. And I pray that would be the same for others here, Lord, that you are glorified. And I thank you. Amen. Let's worship God. Psalm 134 says, The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promises. Thank you. 
For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love and kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him.
so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Hope in Christ. This morning I've been given the privilege of telling you a bit more, more about the Operation Christmas Child program. I can't stress enough how much these boxes mean to these kids that receive them. Some kids pray nonstop for the items that they get in the boxes. Others are just happy to have something to call their own. The kids that receive these boxes and the others that hope that they receive these boxes again. Um, they don't get to celebrate Christmas like we do. They don't get to buy gifts for their friends and family. They don't receive gifts. Some have never even received a gift before. And so I would like to tell you a story about a, name, a girl named Olivia. This story touched my heart and I hope it touches yours too. And it's kind of similar to the girl that was just on the video that you just saw. An American mission team was helping to give out the shoebox gifts at our orphanage. Every kid wanted one of those people to hold on to, to give them hugs, to talk with them, to look in their eyes and tell them that they are important. I became super glued to a woman named Connie because I wanted the attention and love that I didn't get in the orphanage. I literally didn't get, I didn't share her with anyone else. I was so defensive of, defensive of her protecting her from every other kid because I knew this was my only chance to ever have someone to talk to me, to ever have someone to hold my hand. I told every kid who tried to get Connie's attention, go away, this is my person, you go find somebody else. Then Connie gave me a shoebox gift. Before we opened the boxes, they shared the gospel with us. It was something brand new to us. Connie was, some, Connie was with me the whole time I looked at my shoebox. At the top of the box, I found hair clips that I loved. I'd wanted hair clips for my whole life, but where we lived, we could never have them. Then I saw a bar of soap, a toothbrush, and toothpaste, and other hygiene items that meant a lot to me. And then I found a friendship necklace. I really wanted to thank Connie for the gifts and the gospel, 
For the first time, I knew that there was some hope out there and there was a God who loved me every day. I just wanted to tell her thank you for everything. And so I picked up the friendship necklace and told Connie, you keep half of the necklace and I'll keep the other half. Maybe one day we can put the hearts together. As I shared the necklace with her, I told her, I love you. That's when God told Connie that she needed to adopt me. I didn't just hear the gospel and learn that there's hope and love and to get a bundle of joy that day with the hair clips. God wanted me to have more than that. He wanted me to have a family. Living in the orphanage, I was never allowed to dream. There was only, there was no way I could ever dream because I'd never get any of the things I wanted to get. So when I found out that Connie's family wanted to adopt me, I was blown away. It was one of the most unexpected things to happen in my life. That, that same year I received a shoe, that same year that I received a shoebox, I accepted Christ. For the next two years, while I was waiting for the adoption to be finalized, I prayed constantly that God would make a way for me to be able to come to my family that would love me unconditionally. I got the shoebox when I was 12 years old, and I came to the United States to a brand new family when I was 14. It was something that only God made possible. My shoebox is something imprinted on my heart that never goes away. It's an unforgettable moment that I can talk about every day. It had an everlasting impact, an internal impact. Starting in 2017, candy and toothpaste will not be allowed in the shoebox gifts due to custom relations. We remain confident, however, that your gift will still delight a child in need. These gifts make kids feel so loved, cared for, and encouraged. So I encourage each one of you, even if you only have the time to buy one thing, anything, do it. If you see something in passing or if you just grab some old toys from your attic, please look it over. Please consider donating it. And if you just lay, if it's laid upon your heart, bring them here or grab a box to pack yourself. It will mean the world to some, some little one out there. Please help us with this ministry. Due to COVID-19, we were running behind and have not collected nearly as much as we'd expected to. Our goal this year is to pack just 25 boxes. So please, help in whatever way you can. We could really use your help because like Dr. Seuss once said, if someone like you doesn't care a whole awful lot, nothing is ever going to get better. It's just not. Lastly, I encourage you to look up the Operation Christmas Child website and read some of the stories that, have, that they have on their site. If you have trouble finding them, feel free to ask me or Paula how you can find them. Please be a part of our ministry to share Jesus' love with others. Thank you. Thank you, Kaylee, for sharing with us. It's interesting to me that um, We've been doing Operation Shoebox for many years, and it seems like it's a very uh, impersonal type of ministry to me that you put things in a shoebox and off they go. But over the last few years, God's impressed upon me, and I hope you too, that this is a ministry that touches hearts for Christ. It is meaningful, and even though we put something in a box and we send it off, and we don't know where it goes, God knows. And, it, and we hear story after story of how it touches lives. So we encourage you to be a good steward of what God has given us, especially in, in the gospel and in salvation, and that wonderful gift that we share that through Operation Christmas Child. So it, it's hard to think about it in the middle of July when it's 90 degrees out and thinking of, about Christmas but this is the time to be doing it. So thank you again, Kaylee. This is the time when we normally would uh, take our offering. Uh, and of course, uh, due to the circumstances with, uh, with COVID, we're not doing that. Uh, so we wanna remind you uh, on your way out uh, that there'll be both by the side door and the back, a box that if you wanna drop your offering or your tithe into, that's fine. Uh, if you're watching at home, we want to encourage you that if God puts it on your heart to make a donation, uh, that you can go to our website, which is hicnh.com, 
and click up on the top where it says give and you can give uh, through a secure website uh, which will come directly to the church remember it's a privilege to give God says and we don't always think that way but he wants us to give out of our heart and give with joy um, so let's also thank him and we, we really want to thank you for being faithful uh, and remembering the financial needs of the church that it takes to operate God is the the one that provides all for us but it's part of his plan to do that uh, through us father thank you so much for providing each month Lord we know that June was a particularly good month for us financially Lord where you you blessed us to meet our budget and our expenses were down and so it was a, a positive month father and and uh, we thank you for the blessings that you have promised us as we give with a joyful heart uh, and as we give out of our need our own personal need father sometimes sacrificial that that you desire that but always with the joy uh, in our heart and knowing that it is a privilege to give we pray father that you will take this offering this morning and the gifts that that come to us and that you will use them for your purpose here at Hope in Christ Church. Lord, there are many ministries within the body and also in the community. And we think of, of uh, how you have blessed us to be able to reach out to the community with the, the undercover pantry and the lives and, that it may have touched and the, the meals that it has provided for those that have been unable. And Lord, uh, we just thank you again. Uh, that you are the source of all of our needs. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is the time when we share our, our blessings and our prayers uh, together. And uh, this morning as Deb and I were, were uh, doing our devotions together, and you know that sounds pious and really great and all that, but the, the, the older I get and the longer I walk with the Lord, the more I really come to know that we are just sinners. And it's only by his grace that we have the gift of salvation and what we have. But we were reading in Luke this morning uh, in chapter eight, uh, where Jesus was, was speaking and he said, this was when he was doing, uh, talking about the parable of the sower. And he said, the seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, by the life's riches, and by life's pleasures. And they do not mature. Are you maturing in Christ? Um, we have to very carefully um, recognize that we will go through difficult times. Uh, we will pray together, we will worship together, we will be joyful together. Uh, but what struck us this morning was not only that you can be choked and your maturity stunted, your growth stunted by the worries of life, but also by the pleasures. And so we, we always have to keep things in perspective. The gift of salvation that God gives to us through Jesus Christ is truly the only gift that comes with no conditions. But in our life, in a process of maturing, he gives us his word right here. And it is very conditional in many ways where God says, if you do this, then I will do that. And if you do that, then I will do this. And this is how we become blessed in the midst of our difficulties and the storms and the pleasures of life. The message this morning is, is going to be out of James, one of my favorite passages, which talks about the blessings that God has for us and how to receive them out of one of my favorite books, uh, which is, is James. We're very, very practical. Uh, God desires us to be practical uh, in many ways. And so uh, I encourage you to open your heart to how God can bless in the midst of concerns and worries uh, and of just life and, and listen carefully and see. So this morning, part of, of 
that process is sharing what God is doing to you in, in your life in a positive way so that we can encourage one another as well as our prayers. So who would like to share something that is, God is doing in their lives this morning? Thanks, Katie. Katie shared the her your sister you said had a um, healthy baby boy this this week and uh, in his home and what a wonderful blessing that is. Uh, new life. It kind of gives us a different perspective when we see that. Doesn't it? Anyone else? How would you like to share any of your prayers this morning? In your bulletin. Uh, you received uh, a list of uh, prayer requests that we want to run through this morning before we pray together. Uh, first, we want to note um, with sorrow, but also with joy, the passing of Kathleen Malway, who uh, was the head of the Concord Pregnancy Center for a good long time. And I think most of us know that she suffered a stroke a while ago and was not doing well in recovery. She went home to be with the Lord. Uh, that's uh, she will receive her blessing there and her reward for all that she has done uh, and how God has used her and her faithfulness but still a difficult very difficult time for her family and her friends and loved ones so we want to hold her up in prayer and uh, Todd mentioned earlier about TLC uh, is going to be starting up again uh, soon and, and we are faced, uh, as that is a ministry of the church, we are faced with the same issues of starting that up as what the, the public school systems are and having the right balance of how that should look within the constraints of being safe and not being uh, overly uh, reactive. It's a very difficult situation for the leadership. And so uh, we are pleased that it's going to be starting up. We want to ask you to be praying for the elders uh, and the leaders at TLC, that we can uh, have good guidelines that uh, allow for, uh, for safety and also allow for a good learning environment uh, with the children. And uh, at the same time, we want to hold up Awana. Uh, we're going to hold off on starting Awana at this point because of the closeness and proximity with the children but we don't know just how long the Lord will have us tarry, and we will need people to uh, be involved both in the leadership and in the working of Oana. So we want to ask your prayer for that. Uh, the women's ministry is alive and healthy here, and it's, it's uh, growing a little bit, and we're pleased about that. We want to continue to ask God's blessing upon it. Uh, we want to continue to pray for the local churches and for our leaders uh, in the community. Uh, in this difficult time, we pray that uh, God's uh, light uh, can shine in the darkness and that people can see that God is still on the throne. There are health concerns within the, the church. Uh, we continue to pray for Bonnie and for others who are in, uh, in need with health issues. Uh, and also for our online visitors, for those of you who might be listening at home, uh, you can't share your prayer requests, but God knows what they are. And as we come before the throne this morning, uh, we will hold those up as well. So now if you would just join me this morning uh, as we come before the throne of grace. Father, uh, you tell us to come boldly before you with our our petitions and our requests and father so we do so uh, we do so now father we have uh, needs in the body we have needs in the community and we certainly have needs in our country and in the world uh, father we pray that you would uh, help the leaders in our country and in our states and our communities, Father, to seek your leading and your direction and 
what to do in their, in their, under their jurisdiction and how to balance uh, safety with uh, health and fellowship and the economy and all those different things. Uh, Lord, we pray that uh, if it be pleasing to you that you would provide a vaccine uh, for this, Lord, uh, soon, or that you would provide a way that we might be able to come back to a normal life, but that, Lord, you would use this uh, to bring people unto you and to turn to you, Lord, and to understand our weakness, Lord, and that we, we really don't have control, but that you do. Father, we pray for Hope in Christ Church. We pray for the leaders here. We pray for wisdom, for your wisdom not theirs, Lord, for your leading, your guidance, for discernment of what that is, Lord, that you can uh, take us where you would have us be. Use us in this community, Lord. Help us to be a light in this community. Help us to be active, Father, uh, in helping people. And Lord, we pray that you would draw people uh, to you through this church and others who are believing churches, Lord, that, uh, that the kingdom would be added to. And Lord, we know that that is your purpose and your desire. Use us for that purpose, Lord. Uh, Father, we, we pray for our uh, police and first responders and people in authority, Lord, who are under attack right now in many places in our community and in our country. Lord, we pray uh, for their safety and protection. We pray, Father, for, uh, for people to understand and respect uh, these people who are there to help us, Lord, and uh, to, uh, to rush in when we're rushing out and to come to our rescue when we need help. Lord, we pray that you will uh, help our country to uh, come and and be peaceful once again, Lord, and that you will help us to have the right perspective and the right understanding of all people being equal, Lord, in your eyes and in each other's. Lord, we pray for our pastor. We thank you for, for him and for his desire, Lord, to uh, serve you and to serve us and to serve this community. And we pray for he and his wife that you will allow them uh, to, uh, through your grace, Lord, to have time together for themselves and their families as well as serving in, in what you have called them to. We, we thank you for his faithfulness, Lord, and for their faithfulness. And Father, uh, we hold up all the prayers that are unspoken this morning, both here in our body and at home. Uh, we know that you know what they are. We, we Bring them before you, Lord, and we seek your solution. We pray, Father, that we might have the heart that you desire for us to have when we ask and that we would receive with the right heart as well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, good morning. Day to be in the house of the Lord. New Hampshire is always teaching me things. Do you know how many times a hornet can sting you in rapid succession? I don't know, at least three. That was my lesson for yesterday. Um, if you have your Bibles and a pen and your insert, uh, you can, you can uh, pull those things out. Now, if you're missing any of those three things, there's a pile of them right outside that door. And before you um, get back into your seat, um, um, we will still be kind of uh, getting ready. So you won't miss a thing. If uh, any of the things that we're talking about here today so far, and also um, the insert that uh, is inside your bulletin, is something that you want to receive ahead of time, along with the prayer list and any information, uh, about our church and what we're up to this week, just contact Katie and um, she'll get you on the email list and you'll get all this stuff ahead of time. 
Also, uh, a visitor's pack. If you're watching us on the internet and you'd like to know uh, more about us, what we do, who we are, we can even mail one of those to you if you would like. Um, what else did I want to say here today? I didn't get the email about the tie-dye, so I'm kind of left out. Um, this is an ozone generator. Um, I just wanted to bring this to your attention because if, if you're wandering around here in the, in the next six months or so and you see this sitting in, in the middle of a room humming, um, don't breathe deeply from it. Um, it's not healthy. Uh, it's not going to suck you into a parallel universe or anything. You don't have to run, but uh, if that's in a room, it's cleaning the air, it, it's killing any germs in there, so just don't, um, don't stick your face in it, but don't, you know, don't stay in the room, okay? It's not, it's not that healthy. So, um, we are continuing our look in the book of James, this amazing practical guide to living as a Christian through the adversity that we find around us in the world and also inside of us. Right? Uh, so if you turn with me to the book of James, chapter 1, we're up to verse 19, where James boils down our attempts to live as God instructs us into three relatively easy steps. Easy to understand. Um, whether it's easy to implement in your life, that's going to change according to who you are and what you're doing and, and probably what you're going through at the moment. But they are not complicated steps. And the end result of these three steps is what James calls a blessed life. Anybody think that might be something that you'd be interested in? Or is that just me? I think a blessed life is really something that, uh, that we should take a, a better look at. So let's give that a shot. And the pursuit of this blessed life is something that reminds me of a guy. <clears throat> his name was Jack. Jack runs a small engine shop. It's a repair shop and a sales uh, shop. And he sells lawnmowers and post hole diggers and weed whackers and all that kind of stuff that you might use around your yard or or at work. And the way Jack explained it to me, a guy came into his store one Saturday and bought a used chainsaw. Nice one. The following Saturday, the gentleman returned and he had some complaints about it. He said, it just doesn't cut the way I thought it should cut. I, I, I want to I wanna heat my house with wood this year. I've got a lot of wood to cut and I, I bought this saw. It seemed to be the best one you had and I'm, I'm working like crazy with it, but I'm not getting much done. So Jack went through it, he, he checked it all out, it seemed fine. Later that day, the customer picked it back up again, and the following Saturday, he came back, and, and, and it, it had the same kind of complaint again. So Jack took it right down to the, to the bare minimum, looked at all the different parts, put it back together, started it up, he sharpened it like a razor, even went out back of the shop and cut some logs with it. The customer returned, picked it up, and it wasn't two hours later, the, the, the customer could come back in, stormed back in, threw the chains on the table and said, this thing's worthless, I want my money back. Cutting logs for two weeks with the saw that you sent me and I mean, you finished up cutting up one tree and Jack said, well, of course you can have your money back but I just can't understand what would be wrong, I've gone through it twice. And Jack put on the choke and he, he, he pulled the, uh, the cord, the chainsaw roared to life and the customer stepped back and said, what's that noise? He never started the saw, right? He was cutting trees, trying to <laughs> go like this with it. It's not going to work, is it? And that's the same message that James is bringing to the early church and to us as well. You know, we've been given something awesome, an awesome tool by an awesome God, his word, but we need to use it as it was intended in order to get the work done that God has prepared for us. And that's our big idea this week. The one main principle that this, that this, scrap, that this scripture gives us, the one thing that develops, the one thing that I pray you will take home from this sermon, is that God gives us his word so that we'll use it to live a blessed life. So let's jump into the scripture and see how God works through James to bring us, this, bring us this message. So James 19, and we'll bring it up to 25. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness 
the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like the man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer but forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. That's some great imagery there that God gives us through James. And a couple of quick definitions to make sure we're on the same page. God's word, scripture, right? The books of the Bible compiled by God's own spirit that in their original script are God's own words. That without error, they're authoritative in our life and our faith. That's why all these sermons that you, that you receive here on Sundays, they're, they're t- uh, tightly revolving around specific verses. You don't want to hear what I have to say about things. Right? So we, we, we circle these sermons tightly around Scripture. Right? Because it's perfect, because it's necessary, because it's sufficient. My, my words don't have those qualities. That is the tool for life that God's given us. And here in these few verses, it's sort of a quick user's guide for this tool. Right? How do you take God's living word? We all have it. If you don't take one with you, you've got a big stack right back there by the door. If you have one but you want to, take one anyways. We can always buy more. How do you take that and bring it to a blessed life? What's the process? blessed life that God intends us to have. Let's find out. Okay, the first two verses show us step one. God's word should be received humbly. Humbly is not to think of yourself as important or exalted or better. And in this context, right, it would be in comparison to who is bringing it to you. You're not talking about James. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about God himself. Because right, we saw last week, I quoted some verses here, uh, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Right, James is going to give us some, some tips on how to receive God's word humbly. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Cleanse your life. Right, Cleanse your life by getting rid of all the filth from the evil in your lives. Right? That's the sin in our life. That's nothing new. We've heard this before. These commands are all things that that lie elsewhere in Scripture that we've looked at. It shows us how to live a holy life that honors God. But here, in the context of James, it serves a secondary purpose. Not only these things, uh, uh, things that we do to pursue a holy life, but they're here And they're shown as a way to prepare yourself for humbly receiving the word of God. So let's look at them a little bit closer. Be quick to hear and slow to speak. That's the attitude that we have to have. You don't want to, if you don't want to listen, if you're more interested in your own opinion, you're not going to receive anything. You're not going to be listening. You're too focused on what you're thinking about about yourself. To be a good listener means you're not always looking for a place to jump in. State your own opinion. You know, you can do that in prayer. But right now we're talking about receiving the word of God. Right? When you receive in the word of God, you shouldn't be saying, yeah, but, all the time. You shouldn't be saying anything at all. Right? Just let God speak. His words are going to be a truer commentary on your situation than you could ever have. Set aside your urge to jump in. Stop thinking that what you already know is so important. Listen to what God is saying. And it's much more than just just hearing it. It's much more than just reading it. It's receiving it as the greatest authority in the universe and the perfect standard of truth. What could we be saying that compares to that? That's what humble is. To understand who we are and who's talking. 
We've got nothing to add to the perfect word. We also need to be slow to anger. If you're going to receive anything, you can't be angry about it. When you're angry, you're shut down. You've got a big barrier up. All your focus is on an offense that you feel has been dealt to you, whether it's real or perceived. You know, anger shuts down your, your ability to receive anything in humility. And the Bible here is not saying never be angry. Luckily. It says be slow to anger. Right? Don't be quick-tempered. Don't be judgmental. Don't be stern. Don't be ready to criticize. You know, that's a prideful attitude. It's going to inhibit receiving God's word. You know, prideful anger doesn't produce the righteousness of God, is what our scripture says. Right? Anger's not, not always wrong, right? But it's wrong when it's quick, and it's wrong when it interferes with your humility. You know, we saw back in, in, in Mark 3 when Jesus healed the man's hand on a Sabbath, and he was accused of breaking a law by the Pharisee that were actually following around looking for, him for a, a place to attack him. And Jesus, it says, Jesus looked at them with anger. Because he was grieved at the hardness of their hearts. It was in response to their arrogance. It was in response to their absolute refusal to see what was right in front of them due to their prideful religion. That's righteous anger. Right? So in following Christ, there is an acceptable anger, but it's one that's, that's defensive. Right? It's protecting a person. It's protecting a principle. It's protecting the gospel. Something that's in jeopardy against unjust treatment or persecution. That's righteous anger. Right? And that can coexist, I've always wanted to use that word up here, with a humility that can receive the word of God. And if you want to receive the word of God, don't be deafened by self-righteous anger. It's going to block the humility you need to, to receive it and to absorb it. And the third way to stay humble and receive God's word is to cleanse your life. 21, uh, verse 21 says to put away the filthiness and rampant wickedness. Or the, or the Christian standard says get rid of the moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. Okay, the Greek word for, for get rid of, we've looked at that before, uh, is to strip away the things in our life that separate us from God. Or in this case, to receive the word humbly. Okay, stripping things away from our lives can be a painful process, can it? Some of these attitudes, some of these behaviors have been with us for a long time. They're stuck tight. And I've stripped down quite a few cars in my day. And you have to go through a lot of different ways of doing it, depending upon what's stuck and how hard it's stuck. It's not a pleasant process. It's hard. It's dirty. It reveals some real ugliness that's hidden there under bright and shiny paint. That can be like us, can it? I've used a sandblaster for stuff that's stuck very tightly. I've used grinders for stuff that's dug deep and down into the metal. I've used chemicals to get to places that's not easily seen. The last car I stripped was my Chevelle and I was able to only use a razor blade because the old paint hung on there very loosely but it was still a long arduous process that left blisters on my fingers. Stripping sin from our lives is, is, is the same kind of thing. Some of it's stuck hard and it won't come loose until you grind it out. Some sin is hidden, and others will never see it. And we even pretend it's not there, but you have to strip it away by immersing yourself in God's grace and God's power. Other times, it's not something that we're super attached to. It hangs on there loosely, but it still takes a long time to break away from it. But that's what's necessary to humbly receive the word of God. We all need to work through this stuff. We need to identify the things in our life that God opposes and strip them away. But for some reason, we also think that the obvious sins are more serious than the ones that nobody else sees. And that's not the case in this context of James. Right? 
I mean, going out and getting drunk and waking up in a strange bed is not more serious than the envy and lust hidden in your heart. They're equal in their ability to remove God's word being able to be received into your heart. Swearing at the top of your lungs and thinking the same words are equal in damaging your attempts to receive God's word. Okay, some ripples throughout time and space and to create other havoc. But in this context, for your ability to humbly receive the word of God, it's the same stuff. You know, these, these three steps could be hard. They can be painful. But look at the rewards. Right? Without being able to, to humbly receive his perfect word, you're stuck. It's like, it's like driving around in a car in a strange town with no GPS and no map and, and no person to ask directions to. You, you, you're just driving down one street after another, wondering if it's the right one. And you could be on the right street, but you'd never even know it. You need God's word to guide you. And these three steps are going get, to get, get you that way. The only way to receive God's word is to humbly receive it. Uh, I, I was trying to think of, of, of a way to explain this clearer. Um, I, I shoot and hunt with a, with a flintlock rifle sometimes. I love it. A gun created, you know, recreated from like the 1800s, early 1800s, like five feet long. It weighs like 20 pounds, and, and it only shoots one shot at a time. It uses a piece of rock, right, to ignite the gunpowder. You have to put all the stuff in the end of it. And um, it's about as low tech as you can get. And I struggle with it. I don't know much about it. And don't let the fact that a deer galloped into the path of a bullet last year fool you. <laughs> I'm not very good at it. But, but I know a guy that knows all about it. As a matter of fact, he builds them for a museum. So last year he offers to let me target shoot with him. Okay, so what do I do? I go there. I don't say much. And I listen. Because compared to what he has to say, I don't know anything at all. And I'm in need of what he knows. I don't get angry if his ways are different than mine. I don't take offense if he points out things that I'm doing wrong. I don't act like a numbskull and offend him. I don't have a prideful attitude. Basic behavior, right? This is the behavior that I can exhibit to allow me to get the most truth from him so I can apply it to my pitiful hunting life. It's the same thing. It's the same thing we go through in life. Same scenario. God has what you need. Take advantage of what he's offered you. And you're not going to be able to do that if you're thinking, I don't have time to listen to this. I'm so smart, I should probably add my thoughts in here and here and here. Or, I'm mad and I've been offended and I'm not doing anything and somebody makes this better. Or, I make my own rules, sure I'll listen, but if it contradicts what I believe and what I am doing, I'm out of here. Right? Those are the three things that James is telling us to be aware of. And if we can stay away from those three things, we can humbly receive God's word. And if we do that, verse 23 through 25 says that God's word should be meditated on constantly. Okay, so everybody make a big circle and cross your legs. I'm joking. The word meditation is much older and much, much more useful than how it's understood and experienced outside of the Christian faith. Now, if you notice on the outline that I've given you, I've given you many references to it, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, meditating um, in the Bible, the concept of meditation uh, is seen throughout the Bible. And it's one that we all need to know more about. It's one that we should practice a lot. You know, our scripture says that once you have received the word of God humbly, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry by stripping away our sinful behavior. We have to not forget it by looking at it and persevering. Study it. 
Continue to keep it in your mind. Ponder it, repeat it, memorize it, calculate it, imagine it, think about it. That's Christian meditation. We lost a giant in the Christian world this week. A man that was and a man that continues to be very influential in my life and in the life of the Christian church uh, worldwide, J.I. Packer. And I posted a couple of uh, different articles on our Facebook page this week in reference to him. He was a uh, British-born uh, Canadian Anglican uh, pastor and theologian. Uh, just had an incredible gift for taking God's word and bringing it right into your life. Um, amazing guy. I would recommend his book, Knowing God, to anybody. It's a, it's a must read. And along with um, The Holiness of God by Sproul and, and The Pursuit of God by Tozer, I would say, I mean, those are the three biggies. And if you guys are interested in reading those, I have copies in my office you can borrow. But this one, um, uh, Knowing God, is, uh, is, is really, really good. And uh, I'll quote from J.I. Packer's uh, Knowing God right here. Christian meditation is a lost art today. Christian people suffer grievously from their ignorance of the practice. Meditation is the practice of calling to mind, thinking over and dwelling on and applying to oneself the various things of God's word and the ways and purposes and promises of God. It's an activity of holy thought, consciously performed in the presence of God, under the eyes of God, by the help of God, as a means to communicate with God. It's not new age, it's not yoga, it has no guru, you don't have to chant or sit in any particular position. What I can do, let me bring you a couple of verses uh, from the Old Testament especially uh, and explain to you just how this works. In Joshua 1.8, uh, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you'll be careful to do according to all that is written in it. And then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Joshua had just taken over God's children after the death of Moses. And this is how God wants him to proceed. Right? One of the first things he says to, uh, to Joshua, meditate on my word and you will have success. Uh, Psalm 119, 148 is a, is a great illustration too. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promises. So this guy, he's in the outskirts of the city. Maybe he's up on the wall alone. Maybe he's you know, outside of an encampment or something. And he's looking into the darkness for anything that could be an enemy ready to attack them. Right? Do you ever feel like that? You dads must know this, right? Watching over your family, trying to keep them safe from whatever pops out of the culture next to attack your family. You stay alert, you stay focused on your mission of, of protecting and, and of supervising, but by meditating on God's word, right? Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Christian meditation. Philippians 2.5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ. Christian meditation. And I have a fantastic book here from uh, my friend, uh, Pastor Jay Lauder. Um, he sent it to me, I think it was for Christmas last year. Um, he's in that church in Illinois that let me preach there last week over the internet. And uh, it's, a, it's a great book, Reclaiming the Art of Biblical Meditation by Robert Morgan. It takes uh, dozens and dozens of, of scripture verses that have to do with meditation and, and brings them out into our lives. So it's not, uh, he doesn't have a, a topic and, and finds verses to attach to his topic. He starts with scripture and shows us how they're all in reference to how we need to meditate on God's word. It's a, it's a great, great, great book. Um, I, I can give you a, a little bit of insight in how it works in my life, right? I've introduced you to, well, you know that in the morning we do Facebook devotional. So I'm in the word first thing in the morning, 6 o'clock, 5.30, around there somewhere. Um, and I got a chapter under my belt at that time. And when God brings um, a portion of that scripture... Uh, to my heart. It, it feels as though something that I need to remember or maybe I can use it in my life and I've introduced you to my buddy the book before, right? My little black book. Got my invite cards in there, right? One side's my prayer request, the other side's the scripture. I write them down in there. I meditate on them. I think about them. I might research them a little bit. It might turn into a little self-study that goes on for a couple of months. If 
it's something in here that really rises to the surface. And after a week or two, God's really putting it on my heart that I need to take it to the next step. It'll move on to this. And this is something I keep on my desk and I work. And this is um, the scripture that I'm working on memorizing, which I'm horrible at. That's why I have to make such a big production out of it by printing things out and leaving it on my desk. But this is the stuff that I meditate on for years at a time. That's how it works in my life. It's going to work a little different, different in, in, in all of our lives. If you keep a Bible with you, even the one on your phone, you keep a notebook with you, like the one I have, it's going to help you. It's going to help you very much. I've got about 17 minutes, more or less, to get from my house to church, and then, you know, another 17 minutes home. In the morning, usually, I'll, I'll, I'll listen to Alice to beg. But on the way home, that 17 minutes, a lot of the time, I'm working through scripture verses. You know, 17 minutes works, works, works quite a bit to get that stuff kind of moving around in my mind. What about the middle of the night when you can't sleep? Or is that just me? Maybe it's just me, but sometimes when I can't sleep, it's because something's bugging me. If something's bugging you, God's got words that'll, 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 that'll get you through that. Maybe reveal, you, reveal to you why you're being bugged or what you can do about being bugged. That's where the cell phone comes in, because you don't have to turn a light on. You don't have to wake up sleeping beauty next to you, right? You can kind of stealth mode meditate. Listen... Just start reading. You know, uh, God is going to put it on your heart when you get to a spot where you need to latch onto it. He's going to let you know that. He's going to tell you to stop, take notice, ponder about it, think about it, pray through it, ask God to reveal its meaning. How does it apply to my life? How does it apply to my faith? How does it apply to, to what I'm struggling with right now? It's Christian meditation. Again, to try to illustrate this to, to, in a clear fashion, um, I, I'm sure some of you have been through some really tough examinations in your life, much tougher than I've been through. The, 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 the most um, difficult ones I've been through were, were for my electrical licenses and then uh, for my uh, ordination. And for all three of those situations, the only way I can get through that is to own that material, to immerse myself in it to live that material, to have that so part of my life, it just comes out. That's how it works. That's how it works. It becomes so part of your life, it's right where you need it when the situation comes up. So you can use it. And that's James's next point. God's word should be obeyed entirely. You have to use it. Right? Ordinarily, we think about reading and obeying God's word so you can learn to be humble or learn to meditate on Scripture. But what James is saying is take that concept that you've been using all your life and flip it upside down. Right? Be humble to receive God's word. And once you receive it, meditate on it. Once you meditate on it, obedience will come more naturally. It will flow out of that process. That's why James is such a cool book. It's all about a living our faith, right? Like a user's manual, how to live your faith. It's much easier to obey God's word if you receive it humbly and meditate on it first. Because it's so ingrained in your mind that his word is, is like your go-to behavior or your, your default setting. And the scripture said it's going to lead you to the blessed life, right? The blessed life that God has planned for you. And that's what he's saying in verse 25. Be a doer who acts and you will be blessed in your doing. Right? You're doing life. That's what you're doing. Doing life according to God's word. That's a blessed life. 
And if you don't act on the word that you received, James says that you're deceiving yourself. What he's saying here is that if you think that knowing things about the, about the Bible is enough, then, then you're mistaken. If you think that just knowing about the gospel is the goal, you're on the wrong track. Right? There's millions of people in this world that don't know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. In comparison, what in the world difference does it make who wrote the book of Hebrews or if Christ is going to return before or after the tribulation? In comparison to the souls that need the love of God, it's pittance, right? We need to be doers. We need to take that word and use it. Don't be wrong here. I mean, this is a place for, for knowing things. I mean, I love kicking around those issues. But don't deceive yourself to think that's the goal of knowledge. It's not. The goal is to use God's word to do things, the things that he's prepared us to do. And that's what it means by being a blessed life if you're a doer. We throw that word blessed around, right? Blessed by God in the New Testament is to have the joy that comes from receiving favor from God. In the New Testament, blessed is, is mostly translated as favored by God. Blessed is the deep and the joy-filled contentment of knowing that God is present with you and he can't be shaken by poverty or grief or, or famine or persecution or any other trial, tragedy, or temptation that we face. So if you plug that definition in to our scripture, you see that our doing God's word, acting on what we've received, acting on what we've med meditated on, is a guarantee that if you do it, it'll be favored by God. Being blessed is this way. It's not our comfort. It's not our prosperity. It's not our health. It's not our relationships. It's, but our, it's our contentment. It's our joy and our trust in his care for us. And his provision to carry out his doing, whatever that happens to be. Right? Doesn't mean that anybody's going to like you, or applaud, or even care. That doesn't have any bearing on these verses. To be a doer is to obey God's word, to obey it completely and obey it now. Right? God's word says, care for the poor. If you don't care for the poor, you're not obeying. God says, God's word says to, for us to carry each other's burdens. If you don't do that, you're not obeying. Christ says, love one another like I loved you. Right? Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only as what's helpful for building up others according to the needs so that they may benefit those who listen. Those are all in here. I didn't throw a dart at the scripture board. You know, th those, are, those, are, those are ones that I'm working on. Receive it. Meditate on it. Obey it. One, two, three. Let God guide you in your reading. And when you hit the right place, you're going to know. And you're going to write it down in your book, and you're going to meditate on it, and then you're going to do it, and it's going to change your life. Because you're going to be blessed. When you put these things into practice, these are, the, these are the, the key to living a life that's blessed by God. It's not a comfortable life with no trial and no temptation. It's not a prosperous life with all the bells and whistles and, and shiny things. It's not even a healthy life with a... 125 or 72 BP or a under 25 body fat or, or no sickness in sight. But nothing to do with that. It's a blessed life in which you're doing what you've received and meditated on. Right? Where God wants you doing what God wants you to. And as the worship team joins me up here and we conclude this service, that is my challenge this week for you and for me as well. Hearing it's no problem, right? You can do that without any effort. Your mind might be a million miles away. But will you receive it humbly? Will you meditate on it constantly? 
And will you do it now and entirely? And it's not just these individual components that, that James and God want us to understand. It's the sequence that makes this work so well. So it makes these words go from, from black and white and red to a real living word that permeates our minds as we continually meditate on it until it becomes our natural behavior. Right, Living that blessed life of doing his word. So use this word. Use it for the purpose that God has intended. There's two last quotes I want to I give to you because um, I like quotes from people that are smarter than me. D.L. Moody said, God didn't give us scripture to increase our knowledge, but to change our lives. And Charles, Charles Spurgeon said, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who is not. So like that poor guy sawing at the tree with a chainsaw. Let's not do that. Let's use what God's given us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, help us on this new adventure. Help us on these three easy steps that seem so simple, but to apply to our lives can create all kinds of havoc. Help us strip away the things that separate us from you, Lord. Help us humbly receive your word. Help us understand what portions of your perfect word should, we should meditate on. And, and Lord, give us the power and the courage and the strength to do it. I pray that you keep us connected as a body. You would help us impact the world for Christ, Lord. And help us understand your saving grace. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.